Hello, welcome to the Curiosity Show. A while ago, we showed you how to lift up four matchsticks with one. Do you remember that? We arranged them something like this, so that the matchstick underneath, when raised, caused the others to lock together. It's a little bit like your fingers locking together. Well, using that technique, how many matchsticks do you think I could pick up with one matchstick? What's the maximum number? Figure it out for yourself, and we'll see how close you are to the number that I can pick up. What I need to do, of course, is to keep the matchsticks very close together. There's two, three, four, pushing them as close together as possible. Uh, then five, six, seven, working back towards the handle, eight, nine, ten, we're almost out of space, eleven, twelve. I've got just enough to hang on to here, and I'll use the thirteenth matchstick as the locking device across the top. And now for the really hard part, lifting that match underneath. It's important to keep it horizontal, and as you raise it, make sure that the heads of the matchsticks stay level. If they don't, you won't catch all the matchsticks with the locking match. So you can see I'm just pushing them from below so that they stay almost level. As one almost slipped out on that side, bring it back, and it'll take a bit of patience. It may not work first time, but if you are patient, you'll be able to show your friends that it is possible to lift 13 matchsticks with just one. We're almost off the table now. We haven't lost any matchsticks yet. That one's almost gone. So is this one on this side and the one near the end. Now that one's almost slipped out, and so is that one. They're back in position. The locking match has got all of them trapped, I think. And so here's the last part. Up off the table, there we are. 13 matchsticks all held up by just one. Try it on your friends. Now this, to my mind, is one of the great delicacies of all time, rock lobster. And you see them lined up in the fish shops, lobsters and crabs, bright red, ready for people to come along and have a great meal. Once you can get through that hard outer coat. The trouble is, people who've only seen them like that tend to think that crabs and lobsters and yabbies and other crustaceans are bright red in life, and they're not. This bright red only comes when they're cooked. Living, they're really quite different colours, and very beautiful colours too. Let me show you with a live one that size. Here we are. Well, they're very spiky and they're very flippy, but if he can calm down enough, you can compare his colouring with this one here. You notice it really is very different indeed. It's a dark and beautiful maroon, and the legs are really yellowy-orange. And there are subtle patterns in there that you don't see in the cooked red variety. They're very lovely. And if you look at crabs, they're different colours as well. Some of them, even under all their camouflage, are a browny grey colour. Others are bright blue. And even little shrimps that you find swimming around in rock pools are quite transparent they do have little spots of bright colour on their surface. Everywhere you look at crustaceans, they're living colours, not the bright red. So how does the cooked one turn bright red? Well, in this hard outer coat that we were talking about are little coloured cells, and they can expand in size. Normally, a crustacean has three or four different kinds. So if all the purple ones are expanded and the red ones are contracted, it'll be a deep purple. If all the green and blue ones are expanded and the red is contracted, it'll be greeny-blue. When the things are boiled, the greens and the blues and the browns are all destroyed by heat. It's only the red that remains and all those cells expand. So the result is a lobster that's changed colour, gone to red, and all the other pigments are disguised. That's why they all look bright red. It's rather like an autumn leaf. Once the green colour goes and the dying leaf, the yellows and the browns and the reds that were there all the time are allowed to show. You just couldn't see them behind the green. Well, this one doesn't like being out of water, so I'll put it back in and you can watch it as it trundles away. Well, back to the cooked variety. And once I get through that outer coat, I'm in for a treat. But really, I suppose that outer coat warrants a bit of attention as well. King Henry VIII was a very fat king. And as he grew, he had to throw away his old suits of armour that didn't fit anymore. And they're still preserved. You can see them in the Tower of London if you go to England. But it meant that as he grew, he just shed coat after coat, and each one was bigger. And the same thing is true of things like the lobster. As they grow, they have to throw off this hard outer protection, grow a bit, and then secrete a new one. And so if you find a lobster of that size, or like the one I just put back, 
you would find it left behind somewhere along the line this now it looks like a dead lobster but it's not it's very light completely empty and there's always a telltale sign just here where the chest part meets the tail part it's a hole and the live lobster came out of that leaving this coat behind and of course as they grow they keep shedding bigger and bigger ones like Henry VIII until in the end you can have absolute giant exoskeletons that's what they're called left behind by the largest lobsters of all the one that left this behind is still growing and will leave an even bigger one once again the opening there tells you it's an exoskeleton thrown away not a dead lobster and the other ex the other crustaceans do it too this crab has left an exoskeleton that's falling apart now but if I lift up this back section you can see the telltale sign that shows you a crab once lived in there has emerged to grow bigger well enough talk on to my meal my money this one looks as beautiful as you can get but don't forget when you see the bright red ones the living ones have a charm all of their own cheers who is it he's one of the world's most famous explorers and inventors in 1943, he developed the Aqualung, making it possible to undertake exploration of the ocean's depths. For over 40 years now, he and his team of divers, scientists and crew on the Calypso, and more recently the Alcyone, have probed the underwater world. They have revealed its wonders through countless books, films and research. He is Jacques-Yves Cousteau. Coming up, I'll look at some things always getting themselves into hot water, and Dean will find a solution. <laughs>